I never take my phone. Hi. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Let's try this one more time. Take two. Yeah, take two. We'll see uh, <laughs> see if it'll work any better this time. You know, we uh, it's cool that we can do this kind of thing. Maybe. But. We are trying this from home at night uh, tonight. So if you see a angry teenager going past us, that's okay. He's just going to the refrigerator. Or if you see a naked baby, he's probably just up from a nap. There you go, and and both of those things are are very <laughs> possible uh, to have okay. happen. You know, very normal when we're in our home. Bear with us. We're just trying to figure this out. Um, we're trying something new tonight. Uh, we're going to be taking um, uh, some questions here in a little bit um, on our study as well. We are. Hang on, I'm just getting this thing adjusted, so bear with us here momentarily while we get all this um, stuff arranged like we want it arranged. I, I can't see the video, so I don't know what's going on. Anyway, okay, so uh, before we do anything else, uh, we wanted to just let our church family out there know that, that we as a church family have experienced tragedy today. Yeah. Um, one of our elders, um, James Brown, has uh, lost his brother-in-law um, to the coronavirus today. So we, um, as a church family, just wanna we just wanna pray for him, pray for his family, pray for him and his wife Tammy and and all of their family uh, before we do anything else. Um, we wanna pray for them because we just love them so much. So, uh, baby, if you would, would you just pray for them? Absolutely, uh, God. We just we just come to you. With, with heavy hearts, Father, and I just pray that you just uh, surround this family right now in, in their time of need, Father. Father, I pray that you put your loving arms around Jimmy and Tammy and just the, the whole family, Father. But in this time of tragedy, I pray that your glory shines through, Father. Yes, Father, I pray that it, as, as they take hardship, Father, that they cling to you above all things, Father that I pray that your name be lifted on high, Father, that I pray that you are just in the midst of them, Father. I pray that you be on their mouth, Father. I pray that, that they just bring their praises to you, Father. And Father, I pray that um, just when sorrow comes, that joy comes in the morning, Father. And Father, we pray that we can just be the body of Christ that surrounds them, that loves on them, that just gives them what they need father in this time of need we love you and we praise you in jesus mighty name amen 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 and it's that name that's going to get us through this whole thing uh it's the name of jesus that's going to carry us through and and you know all the the guidelines and stuff that we're getting down uh, from medical professionals and, and government leaders those are fine and dandy and and we should do a lot of those things uh but at the same time the only thing that is going to get us through this mess is going to be uh the lord it's going to be the Word of God, the Son of God, the living God, Jesus Christ. He is what's going to carry us through this. He's going to be our healer. He's going to be our redeemer. He's going to be our strength. And he is going to be everything that we need uh, in this situation. So, uh, that being said, you guys know that, uh, most of you know that Tuesday night is our ladies' ministry focus. Um, yes. Unfortunately, we can't have a, a panel of you awesome women of God from the Way Church up here right now. So, instead, you get uh, the amazing Angela Greider and me. So, um, <laughs> But but to, tonight we're gonna we're gonna make a a, a transition um, tonight and okay so is, this is what's going on so I guess we're gonna have to do it like this so this is there you go we will we'll stick together yeah we'll stick together this That'll is not fine. social distancing at all it, that's is, okay. it is not but we don't we don't have to social distance so we'll we'll be okay will uh, we, we be sideways the we, whole time? we definitely don't want to be sideways no it's not transition um, yes. Yes, we were. Tonight, it's, it's not sideways now. So, anyway, good Hi. deal. Okay. <laughs> we're so, 
Look, we have been in a sermon series called The Cradle, The Cross, and The Crown. We started at Christmas with the birth of Jesus Christ, yeah. and we walked all the way through uh, the events of Jesus' life, all the way to the crucifixion, all the way just this past week into the resurrection. Right. And now we are going to be transitioning um, from our Cradle, Cross, and Crown series into a brand new sermon series starting this Sunday called We Are The Church. And uh, what it's going to focus on is the birth of the early church and how that relates to the fate of the modern day church ministry that we're in right now. So we want to do the same thing for our different teaching ministries that are taking place on the uh, different nights of the week. And so, um, you know, we've been talking about it on Tuesday nights about different women that had encountered Jesus in his earthly life. So first we started off with, with Anna, and that was in Luke 2. Um, so Anna was uh, the tribe of Asher, and she was a prophetess, um, and that she was a widow from a, from a young age, and that from there she went to live in the temple. So she went to worship and fast. So after that, um, that she had an early vision of, of Jesus, and when Joseph and Mary took um, Jesus to to the temple. She got to lay her eyes on Jesus, and after she seen him, then she told everyone, or she gave thanks to God, and then she told everyone what she had saw that she had saw Jesus. She did. She absolutely did, and uh, so showed not only was she a prophetess, prophetess, she was an evangelist, and did so many amazing things. Yeah. Um, you know, the next uh, woman that we see in scripture that Jesus encountered was Peter's mother-in-law. Yeah. And, and so, you know, they, they, she's got a high fever, which is something crazy that people are experiencing now. Uh, they call for Jesus. He goes into the house, lays his hands on her, immediately heals her. She immediately comes out of the bed and begins to serve uh, the disciples and serve the community around her. So you can see what encountering Jesus can do. Yeah. Uh, next we see, or not, you know, not immediately next, but next, one of the next ones that we talked about was when Jesus encountered the, the woman um, at the well. At the well. Yeah. yeah. So that's in that's in Luke four. Um, John four. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that's in as in John four. So the woman went to the well and she was completely um, desperate and wanting to be left alone in her shame, wanting to be left where no one could see her. She went in the hottest part of the day um, and she met a man named Jesus and he asked her for a drink of water and that one question changed her life changed her life radically. yes um, and she got the living water and she went on to become a an evangelist just yeah. completely changed everything her shame was gone her past was gone and she went on to to change the world she did she did uh, the next one we had talked about was the woman at the the woman that was caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8 and, um, yeah, you know, a, a lot of you guys are very familiar with that story. They, you know, caught this woman in the act of adultery. They drag her out to the middle of the, 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 the temple square, basically throw her at the feet of Jesus and ask him, you know, whether it's right to stone her or to let her go, basically. Um, you know, wanting Jesus to violate the, the commandments of Moses or the commandments of the Roman law or to go back on his promise of grace and to try to trap him. Uh, we know Jesus says the one without sin can throw the first stone and uh, no one does. Yeah. Right? No one does. And so not only does he change her life by his grace, by his act of grace towards her, he actually convicted all the people around him. And once again, uh, you see a woman at the forefront and at the center of an incredible movement and act of the living God. So, um, and, and then just to go on to what I preached just this past Sunday on Easter Sunday, the first ones to come to the tomb in Jesus' resurrection were the women that traveled with them. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't Peter, it wasn't James, it wasn't John. The first ones to come to the tomb, the first ones to encounter the risen king were the women. Yeah. Now, that, it's, it's so crucial that we identify that so that we understand that they weren't trying to, uh, you know, by the story of the resurrection, they weren't trying to prove a point. They were just telling what happened. Uh, because, number one, the woman's testimony in, the, in that society probably wouldn't have been believed. Yeah. And, and so just the fact that, that they were, once again, the pioneer, like the first, you know, the woman that was a prophetess, one of the first ones that saw him there, one, some of the first evangelists to go run into a city to tell the story of Jesus as a woman, the, uh, you know, the, and this, then the first ones to see the risen king, to encounter uh, the risen Jesus is, is a woman. And, and so the narrative has been for many years that the church of Jesus Christ thought, like, is, is oppressive towards women. And has hindered women, 
And, and in some points they did, obviously, but that's not the narrative of the body of Christ. Like, yeah. that, that's not the narrative. No, not, not in the body of Christ, and, and that they all have an important part to play, and without them, I, I don't know where or how it would, how it would have played out. Um, and, you know, even in today's um, body of Christ, um, I know where I want to be. I want to be like Mary at, at his foot. I don't want to be at the head. Come I, on. I want to be at his feet where she constantly was. Yes, yeah, come on. So today we're going to make the transition. And uh, we're going to go from talking about the women that Jesus had encountered in his earthly life to the beginnings of the early church in the book of Acts. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the, the ladies, the, the women that made such an incredible impact on the birth and the early life of the church. Um, and, and we're going to talk about today about Mary's, you know, Jesus' mother Mary. Uh, we're going to talk about Tabitha in the city of Joppa. And uh, so those are just going to be some uh, awesome teachings. Uh, before we jump in, uh, would you just open us up in, a, in another word of prayer real quick? Yeah. Okay. God, I pray that you just bring a, a freshness, bring a fresh word and, and a fresh anointing on us today. I pray that as, as we do this teaching, that you open our eyes to something new, Father. I pray that you just do a new thing today. Open hearts and open minds, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And, and what I want you to understand today, what we want you to understand is that when we say we are the church, we mean we are the church. Yes. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that, that, that myself and, and Brent and Jr. and Vince are the church. No. It, it means we are we, and not just me and Angela are the church either, yeah. but that we as a collective body that profess Jesus Christ as our Savior and, and experience the Holy Spirit and His Word, we are the church. And that doesn't, and that, that doesn't stop just as, as the way church. Like that is, it does not. That, that is the body. No, like no, no. Is, the, body is, that, that the body of Christ. Right. Yeah, that is, that it, we're not bound by churches. We're not, we're not even in a church building right now. It we're is, not. It's the body of Christ coming together. Yes, we are the church. Yeah. We, we, everyone that professes Jesus right. Christ as Savior because of His sacrifice on the cross, we are the church. And everyone has a part to play. Everyone. And, and I just, important part. yes, a hugely yes. important part. I just want to get that out there. So let me read to you guys from the book of Acts in chapter 1, and uh, then we'll jump right in. Starting in verse 12, the Bible says this. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath's day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying, and those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. And they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Really, we just want to focus on this one last little verse in Acts one chapter or Acts chapter one verse fourteen. Uh, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Yes. So this is huge. Mary, the mother of Jesus. The one chosen by God to carry his son is there in the midst of them as they're in the upper room waiting on the Holy Spirit to come, not really sure what the next step is, praying for direction, just on their face, crying out to God. And Mary, Jesus' mom, is right there in the midst of them. Yeah. In her, in her grief and in her time, still pressing on, still being about, about the mission. Absolutely. Still being about the mission. Still being on mission. Uh, crying out to God. Seeing what the next step is. Serving in the ministry. And, and what it shows is that Mary's heart was not just for Jesus, her son. Yeah. Not just for Jesus, the person. But that Mary's heart was for God. Yeah. Mary's heart was for Jesus, the Savior. Mary's heart was for Jesus, the Messiah. Mary's heart was to serve the church just like her son and her God had called her to do as he gave them those that final you know commission to go and make disciples. She was all in. It really shows that God was her first love. It does. It does. Because, you know, how many of us, if God was to take our child away, would within just a matter of days be right there at his feet serving him? Yeah. You know, she she's she's lost her son. I mean she had to watch him tortured and die. And then when he came back, you know, a few days later, a month later, he's gone again. She's lost her son. But she hasn't never lost her God. Right. 
and she hasn't lost her faith. And and I like in the you know in the very beginnings when when um, when when the the angels come and speak to her, the shepherds come and talk to her, and it says that she's storing all these things up in her heart. You know, and even then she knew that the grief was going to come. But now it shows that she understands what the mission is. And she knows that the grief and the sorrow is only temporary and that the joy that is set before her is going to far exceed the pain that she's experienced in her life. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So then the, the, next, um, the next woman that we encounter is Tabitha, uh, otherwise known as Dorcas. Uh, in Acts chapter 9 and verses 36 through 43. Let me, let me read that for you guys real quick. Uh, this is what the Bible says. In Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek her name was Dorcas. And she was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Uh, Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the, window, all the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up, and... He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. So this is an incredible story. It's only seven verses, but it is so full of amazing stuff. It really is. It really is. Um, so what, what's special about Tabitha? What, what's special about her that, that makes her different than some of the other uh, people that we encounter in Scripture? There, there are so many, so many things. What, what stands out to me um, from the very beginning is it, it seems like that um, what he's trying to, to get across is that she has a simple life because, you know, it says that she's a seamstress that she sews, which, right. which, which I think is, is, is simple. Um, but it says that she's a disciple. It does. Um, and that is only given um, to a title um, to this woman. Right. Um, and Acts is written um, by Luke. And if you look in Luke six forty, a disciple is not above his teacher, but... Everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Wow. So that, so that means that she is reflecting the image of Jesus. That means that her actions are like Jesus. Right. That so much that he has titled her a disciple. Right. And she literally is the only one, the only female yeah. in all of the New Testament that is referred to as a disciple. None of the other women are actually referred to as that title. And they were actually crossing a big threshold by labeling her as a disciple. Uh, because, you know, women would not have been allowed to uh, fall in under the tutelage of the rabbis, right. right? So they would not have been able to be considered as a, as a disciple of one of the rabbinai. And so in order for them to label her as a disciple in this way is, is breaking down a huge wall and opening a, a huge door and, and, and setting a, a really incredible precedent yeah. um, for future, you know, future disciples that would come after her. Uh, you know, women like you and like many of the women from our church that serve in incredible ways that are able to carry that mantle. And, and do, so, you know, do so with authority and do so with power and do so uh, with the glory of God. Uh, one of my favorite things that it says in the scripture about her is that it says that she was always doing good. She was always full of good works. She was always full of almsgiving. She was continually doing good for the world around her. I mean, it just all the time. I mean, it's an ongoing, the way that it's worded in there, it's an ongoing thing. She was full of it. And, and she was constantly, constantly doing these things. And, um, you, know, you know, in the book of James, in chapter 1, in verse 27, it says that pure and undefiled religion in the eyes of the Father is to care for widows and orphans in their trouble. Yeah. 
And, and isn't that what she's doing? That's exactly what she was doing. And she was in the inner circle, so this isn't what they just saw as passing by. I mean, she's, they saw that this was, was her life, her every day. Right, which, which she was modeling Christ, like we said, and we, in turn, should be modeling her. This should be our every day. I mean, this shouldn't be something that we do on Sundays, which we don't even get to do that anymore. And, and it shouldn't be something that we do once in a while whenever a big event rolls around. I mean, this should be our everyday life, that we model the life of Christ in every aspect. Um, I, I, like the, uh, I like what the King James says. It says that she was full. You know, it says that she was full of, of good. And, and that's what we should be. We should be so full of the Holy Spirit that it overflows into the world around us and impacts everybody around us. And that's exactly what she did. Uh, she's got a room full of widows that are bawling their eyes out and crying because they've lost her. Yeah. And, and what, what kind of impact and what kind of legacy are we going to make on the world? I mean, when, when we go, is there going to be a room full of broken people that are standing around desperate because we're gone, or is there going to be like a group of people that does you know does some lip service and, and says oh gosh uh, you know I hate it hate it for y'all you know sorry for y'all's loss or will there be people that are devastated uh, because of the impact that we were able to make in their life by the power of the Holy Spirit that had been viewed been imbued to us. Um, yeah, the impact that that she made, I bet that, that they were probably wondering, would probably take you know ten to fifteen women to do what this one woman had done. Sure, seems like that, doesn't it? <laughs> so they had called for um, for Peter right. uh, to come because he was known for um, have healing. Um, Absolutely. So his gifting was, was was healing, and and he was nearby. So they they called for him to come, um, and they urged him to come quickly. Um, and when he got there, they presented him with the garments that she had made, and they they laid out and presented them to them. Um, kind of like the fruits of her labor, like what she had, what she had done, and, and presented them. Um, Absolutely. And that kind of reminds me of when Jesus uh, was called for Lazarus. You know, um, it does. When he was moved by compassion, I think that you know that that Peter was moved by compassion for um, for her as well. You know, there's a lot in this story that mimics, that parallels the way that, that Jesus uh, was and, and some of the encounters that he also had. Um, so we, we see that, that once Peter gets there, that they do. They lay out all the good works that Tabitha had done. They're, they're, so, uh, ce they're celebrating her even after she's gone. Yeah. And then, so Peter does the same thing that Jesus had done in, in some of those instances, and he asks everybody to leave the room, right? And, and, and to me, that shows that, that he knows that he can't do it alone. That it, um, that Holy Spirit, with you know, without it, with 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 just him, it can't be done. But with Holy Spirit, that he has the power to heal, sure. the the power to raise. Right, and and this is not a show. This is real stuff. This is yeah. real life stuff. This is intense stuff. This is something that uh, you know, you know, that him and God have to work out themselves and and see what see what's going to happen. And that's what Jesus would have done as well. Sure, that it would have been just him and his father. And so uh, these instances actually mimic some things that happened in the Old Testament as well. So when Elijah uh, raised the, the widow of Zarephath's son in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, he did the same thing. He went up to the upper room where they laid the body. He asked everyone to leave. He kneels down and touches the body and, and raises this child from the dead. Uh, when Elisha uh, raises the son of the Shumanite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4 and in verse 33, very similar situation. He, he goes into the room where the body has been laid. He asks everyone to leave. So it's just him and the miracle that needs to happen and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Like you said, it's just yeah. God and the man of God and, and the miracle that needs to take place. It's not a show. It's, 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 not, a, it's, it's not something you know, to be witnessed by an audience. It's just a thing that God needs to do and that only God can do. Well, it, it shows the power of God, and it shows the power of God through his people. Come on. And we can have that same kind of power. We can. You know, God can work 
through us just the same way that he worked you know, through the apostles here in the New Testament. And, and some people say that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. Well, that is just an, an utter and ridiculous lie. And, and God's just the same God now as he was then, as he always will be. And, you know, Jesus said that we would do even greater things than him. You know, the power of the Holy Spirit is available to us yes. right now. If we have this, you know, I, I saw this on, on social media the other day. If an invisible virus that's tiny and microscopic can do this much damage to the world, imagine how much good that faith the size of a mustard seed can do in the lives around us. Yes. So if we would just latch on to that and claim the authority that's been given to us by the power of the living God, man, then amazing things can happen. And I think that more of that would happen if we would clear the room and pray. Come on! <laughs> and talk to our Father. I think many times that we're forgetting that. We're like, you know, just like putting it out there. Get alone with God. It's like I've been saying since this thing started. Since we have to socially distance ourselves from people, it's time to end spiritual distancing and draw close to God. Draw close to God. We've got no excuse not to draw close to God right here, right now. Yeah. Let me tell you my favorite thing about this, this whole story. Um... Okay, then I'll tell you mine. <laughs> okay, that'd be excellent. Or you want to go first? You go. So, Peter bends down. Oh, it's mine. <laughs> okay. Well, you tell that part, then I'll tell what he spoke. You, you talk about how he touched her, and I'll talk about what he spoke. Go, go ahead. ahead. Well, uh, Peter bends down, and, and he takes her by the hand. Yeah, sweet. And he says to her, Tabitha Kumi. Mm -hmm. He calls her by name. He says, Tabitha, rise up. Tabitha Kumi. In Mark chapter 5, when Jesus raises Jairus' daughter from the dead, he kneels down to her, takes her, touches her, whispers in her ear, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, baby girl, mm. sweet one, yeah. rise up. You've only got one letter difference here. Talitha Kumi, Tabitha Kumi. It's the one letter that's different. Otherwise, he said the exact same thing that Jesus said, and the results were exactly the same. Wow. So I just want to talk about how important and how powerful that the Word of God is and how just crucial that it is that we speak as Jesus spoke and that we mimic Him just as much as we can mimic Him. That, Like you said, that we're a reflection of who He is in what we do, in what we say, in what we believe, in what we pray, in how we act, in how we interact, in the faith that we have. It's so crucial that that we mimic Jesus in every possible way that we can. Tabitha Kumi, Tabitha, rise up, and life returned in her. She gasped for that first breath, and she was able to rise up out of that, that dead posture. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that part, but yeah, my favorite part is when, when he grabs her by the hand, that, that enters me, you know, like, and then he's, mim like he's marrying Jesus, because that's exactly he what he would have done, and I love this part, because... Once again, over and over, you look at and you think that the tragedy has hit and these people have think, think that, that she is gone and, and that is it. And once again, that you see the glory happen. You see that God's plan unfolds. Yes. And it's just Come on. Glory. Once it. again, from the mouths of defeat, Jesus snatches victory. Yes. You know, when he does that over and over and over again, he's done it for me, he's done it for us as a family, as a, as a married yeah. couple. I know he's done it for so many people in our church, like right in the midst of tragedy. It's like you spoke about on Easter Sunday. It's in that moment of despair. It's in that moment of utter hopelessness that Jesus swoops in and by the power of the Holy Spirit just takes just what little bit of life we have left and just breathes in it and just amplifies it and multiplies it and just shows us who he really is. Yeah. Faith truly is born in the midst of despair, in the midst of emptiness and in the midst of brokenness. Man, that's where faith is forged. And that's what happens here. It says, well, well first, he took her by the hand, helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that they felt then? Oh, I can't even imagine. Um, I can't. You know, uh, can you imagine what kind of servanthood that they were after this? Oh, man. 
it must have been powerful because today there are still Tabitha Ministries. Okay, come on. What, what, is that, what does that entail? What does um, that look like? In, in different states, there are still Tabitha Ministries that provide shelter and clothing um, to homeless and to, to battered women everywhere. Now, that's a legacy. Yeah. And, and the Bible says this. And in Acts chapter 9, it says, This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Yeah. Once again, once again, this woman, Tabitha, by her life, even by her death, and then by her resurrection, makes an impact on the world. Yeah. And many people from Joppa believed in the Lord. Uh, Tina says he did it for my daughter Tabitha and her unborn daughter. Praise yes. God. See? Yes. See? It's a legacy, man. It's still continuing on. It's still passing on, man. God is still working. He's still moving. And they did this without a microphone or a platform or anything like that. Right. All they had was what God was doing. Yeah, what God had given them. All they had was what God was doing. Yeah. And, and, you know, and that's what we've got now is what God is doing. I mean, we don't get to gather in our, our big, have our big church services anymore uh, for the moment. But we've still got what God is doing. It's like the, the post that I shared, you know, yesterday, man. Eight people, since we went totally online, have given their life to Christ. And, and all we've got is just what God's doing. And, yeah, I mean, we've got the that's Internet and stuff like that. But, yeah, but that's all we could ever need. Yeah. We don't need anything except what God's doing. We just need the testimony of what God has done in us. And we need the testimony of what God is doing in you. And that's where the power is. The power was in the testimony. It says that, that this became known. And that's what we've got to do right now is to make God known. And to make it known that he's still moving in our families. To make it known that he's still moving in our, in our, in our dining room here. Yeah. Uh, to make it known he's still moving in your living room or in your car or in your office or wherever you are. We just need to make it known that God hasn't closed up shop that God isn't hindered by this, this you know, uh, government shutdown that's going on, man. God's still moving. He's still growing. He's still going. Yes. Still going. Now, when when we were in Tel Aviv, which is Joppa is, is modern-day Tel Aviv. Yeah. Um, so we got to, to go there and, and hang out in, in Tel Aviv and, and just uh, have dinner on the beach, one of the most awesome nights of our entire life. Yes. And uh, you know we kept being drawn to these certain areas of the of the sea of the city and of the shore, and um, one of those places is where all this stuff took place. Yeah. And uh, it's still there. This is a real thing that happened at a real place to real people, and and I need to convey that as well. Sometimes we get caught up in the Bible and we think that it's some some fantasy story or some kind of you know uh, uh, made up thing or whatever. But but like we've been to the place where this happened. So this is a, a real thing that happened to real people at a real time, uh, done by a very real God. Um, and, and I think that was, uh, you know, in early in, in my walk with Christ, you know, reading, and I was like, well, how did they know where to go and things like that? And actually walking where he walked. Right. Um, putting foot on the ground there, I mean, things just felt different, right? Like when we were walking, yes. around, I was like, I don't know, there's something different over here, right? Like we were just drawn, like Holy Spirit would just draw us to these to these parts. Absolutely. And to find out that those were significant parts, right? Yes. I mean, they, they, were, they would be favorite parts of, that I love that yes. were important to me. And they were important. Um, just And that was just God saying, hey, th this is it. This is it, my child. And, and it's just beautiful. It is. And, and to, to speak to that specifically, uh, the place in Joppa, in Tel Aviv, that I was most drawn to was the very next scripture here in verse 43 says, Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. This building that I just kept being like, what is that? Not stay away from it. Uh. I, I need to go there. And... That building was the house of Simon the Tanner. Yeah. And that is, is, so God used Tabitha's death not only to minister to all the people in Joppa, mm -hmm. but to draw Peter to Joppa so that he would be at Simon the Tanner's house. And then that is where God gave Peter the revelation 
of, of the sheet that came down with the animals on it, told him to go and kill and eat. And in that revelation, told Peter that the gospel of Jesus Christ was not just for the Jews, but it was for the Gentiles too. And it was in that moment that, 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 that God broke down all those racial barriers, broke down all those religious walls in Peter, and then gave him, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the power to go from Joppa right here where he had called him to because of Tabitha to go and take the gospel to the house of Cornelius to preach the gospel to those men there and to see the Holy Spirit come and save the very first Gentile believer, yeah. which is the legacy that me and you and everybody yeah. watching tonight is still hanging on to. And, and all that happened, all of that happened because this woman was so well thought of yeah. that Peter knew instantly when they called her name that he needed to go and call upon the power of the Holy Spirit to heal her and then to stay there until God gave him a new mission. The Holy Spirit drew him there and then from there the Holy Spirit led him and sent him out. So, yes. Yeah. So you, you said that you mentioned her name. So why is her name translated in different in, in two different ones? Because one is one is Greek. What is? I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> what is? What is <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so her Hebrew name was Tabitha. Yeah. Um, uh, probably in Aramaic, actually. And, and then her Dorcas Greek is name is Dorcas. Yeah, Dorcas is a, is a Greek name. And the reason that they, they put both in there is probably because she was a Hellenistic Jew. She was one of the Greek-speaking Jews. And what's happening is that Luke is trying to bridge the gap between the Aramaic Hebrew-speaking Jews that were you know, located in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and then the Hellenistic Jews that were in some of the other areas up in the, you know, in the northern areas closer to Greece, you know, by the seashore. Okay. By the seashore. And he's trying to bridge that gap. And, and so in giving both of those names, what he's doing is he's making it clear that the gospel is available to the Hebrew, you know, Aramaic Jews, and the gospel is available to the Greek-speaking Hellenistic Jews. And then what they're doing is preparing the way because then from there, it's going to make a huge jump and say that the gospel is also available to the Gentiles like me and you and everyone watching. All so right. he's preparing the way. He's building a bridge. He's making it known. And both of those mean gazelle. They both do. Yes, they're both translated as the animal gazelle. Why do you think that's so? I think that means quick. Like gazelle is fast to me. Adam Steiner it. taught us that, right? Gazelle yes. intensity yes. on yes, killing your debt, right? Yes. From financial yes. peace. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> yeah, and, and so it is. So it, and, and that comes from well, the book. Do you have of, a different? Do you have a different meaning? Well, you're getting your stuff from the book of Isaiah and no. Proverbs, right? Where the gazelle is seen as a quick, strong animal. Do you have a different? I'm getting mine from the Song of Solomon, what? where a gazelle is a majestic and beautiful and filled with love kind of creature. Oh, I like your wife. Just like my wife, <laughs> identical to my wife. But I think that I think it's quick because she was quick to serve and quick to serve those in need. Sure. I think that it was, you know, that she was majestic and beautiful uh, because on the because she was full of goodness and full of love and just full of the Holy Spirit of the living God. I think she was both of those. I yes. think so too. I think I think we can both be right for once. Tabitha was awesome. Yes. Mighty and God woman used God. her in a mighty way. And and here's the thing. God wants to use whatever situation that you're in in your life yes. too. And it may seem desperate and it may seem painful. Like we said at the beginning of this broadcast, we've got people in our church right now that are hurting. Yeah. Uh, there's people all in our community that are scared, that are hurting, that are in pain all across our nation, all across our world. But I tell you what, Romans 8, 28 says that God uses all things yeah. for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And that never changes. It never changes. God uses all things and he's going to use this too if we will let him. If we'll let him, he will use this too. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> sure. If anybody has any questions, please post them, and uh, we would be glad, real quickly, to ask any to answer any questions that you might have about this scripture or anything else. So uh, you know, we'll, we'll wait on that for just a second. But you know, and and just while anybody's posting any questions that wants to. Um, just let me reassure you that, like I said, God's still in control. He's still on the throne. He's going to use all this stuff, but it's going to come down to how we respond yeah. to what's going on in our lives. It's going to come down to how we respond to what's going on in, in the world around us. So are, are we going to respond, you know, like Peter did and immediately go towards the calling of the Holy Spirit? Are we going to respond like Tabitha did and see a need and fill a need? Yeah. You know, she saw a need 
And then she used the skills that she had available to her in order to meet the need that she saw out there. And that's what makes her such an anointed, amazing woman of God. And are we, are we going to be like, G, like Mary's mother, like, excuse me, Jesus' mother Mary, who uh, could have just sit around and been celebrated, or who could have just walked off and disappeared into the distance, but instead chose to be right there on her knees, right beside the rest of the disciples, crying out for discernment, crying out for the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. So we need to model these women of God right now. Yes. We need to be on our knees, just like Mother Mary, crying out to Jesus. We need to be serving in whatever capacity that we can, using the skills and resources that we have available to us, just like Tabitha, and doing whatever that we can to be able to serve. Yes. That's it. So, anything else, Lou? I think that's it. Okay. Um, so don't don't have any questions that have uh, come across. So, but if anybody wants to put any watches this later, wants to put any questions in the comments or anything like that. Um, All right. And you know, God wants to raise up women of God. Yeah. He wants to raise up women of God all over this country all over this community, all over this world. And, uh, you know, that's what he wants, you know, more than anything else right now is for the people of God, the, the men of God and the women of God to stand up and to be counted and to be numbered among the faithful. Yes. Yeah. Anything else to add, my love? I think that's it. Okay. Good deal. Uh, like I said, if anybody's got any questions, put them in the comments. We'd love to answer them. Send us a private message. We would love to, love to do that. Um, you know, uh, next week we're going to jump right back in and pick up where we left off. We're going to talk about Priscilla. Yes. Um, talk I'm about, about that. talk about Phoebe. Um, going to do some uh, do some awesome stuff. Don't forget this weekend we are going to start a brand new sermon series. It really is just building off the one that we we're already in. It's just a continuation. We're going to talk about the early church. It's called We Are the Church. So go out there and and just be who God's called you to be. You need to make a t-shirt winner today. Look there. Um, sure. I think we have an obvious one right there. Okay, and that's it. Yeah, okay. So we're going to give away a We Are the Church t-shirt tonight to Shannon Cronister. She was the very first one to comment, and she's been the, the last one to comment there about sharing this with her girls tonight. So. Congratulations, Sharon. <laughs> so we need your address and send us a size um, in direct message. Good deal. All right, babe, you want to close us in prayer tonight? Absolutely. God, thank you for this this night. Thank you for the opportunity just to dive into your word. I pray that it goes out and it spreads, Father. Father, I pray that we be your disciples. I pray that we reflect you. I pray that we become more and more like you every day. Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God Bye. bless you guys. We love y'all so very much in Jesus' name. Bye. Bye.